Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first-time filmmaker's journey. I'm not your host, Josh Lindsay, but I am the first-time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. So this is a little different this week because usually I'm joined by Josh Lindsay and Jason Rugg, but things have been kind of a little crazy in my life lately, and I wasn't able to schedule time with them this week, and I figured I would just come to you myself. I am still here in Laurel, Mississippi, trying to help my father move into a new location, sell his house, and also all the things in his house. And I'm coming to the end of this journey, and I'm really looking forward to being back home with my family, focusing more on my work and getting back into the rhythm of things. So I tried to figure out what I could do uh, today to just give you an experience that's different than usual, but also meaningful. And I was looking back um, through our library of podcasts and trying to think, could I re-air an old episode that might be fun to listen to? Jason Hoban, our audio engineer, suggested that I look at the Labor Day episode in 2020 and figured out how far we've come since then. I thought that was a great idea. So I looked back to this time last year and I realized that that was the time that my son Hunter Taylor had just come on board to be head of business operations. And we had him on the show on episode 79 and it was amazing. I also, in listening to that episode, realized that we were on just the cusp of beginning our film festival festival journey. So over the past year, so much has happened. It's just been mind blowing. In episode 79, as you'll hear going forward, I was talking about the film festivals that we had coming up. The first one I had heard from was the Chagrin Documentary Festival in Chagrin, Ohio. We had our world premiere there. And as our listeners found out later, we were nominated for, um, you know, best film of the festival, as well as the Emerging Filmmaker Award. I had to record two acceptance speeches, having no idea if I would win an award. And I was so thankful that we did win the best first time filmmaker award. That was super exciting. It's something I'm very proud of. And I love that festival so much. I can't wait to submit a new little short I did called Grueling Glory, which should be, uh, which is out now, but only starting its film festival run. We also talked about we had been selected for the Boston Film Festival. There was some confusion at the beginning of that little journey with the Boston Film Festival. I was come, I come excuse me, I came to learn later that the director of the festival had been going through a challenging time with her own family and COVID was happening and there were lots of cancellations and it was just a very difficult time for them to put on a very big festival, which explained all the confusion in the beginning. And we did have an amazing experience with the Boston Film Festival. There were only three films that were shown live at the you know, theater. And ours was one of them. We opened the Boston Film Festival, actually, and it was an incredible honor. Uh, Even more exciting, my son Hunter Taylor was able to go with me. And due to COVID, we drove from Chicago, Illinois to Boston, and we were there for our very first opening film festival ever. Now, Only about four or five other people were there, and those were the ones I invited myself, because it was really the day before all the movie theaters shut down completely. Our film showed, and the next day that theater closed, and we entered a really whole new world of uh, film festival you know, experiences. And, you know, the movie theaters really took a major nosedive after all of that time. It was very sad. And of course, as everyone else knows, um, you know, over the summer, we began to come out of that COVID cloud only to now be re-entering it, it seems. Um, I'm recording this on September 6th and, you know, it's still kind of hanging over all of us, this Delta variant. Uh, Here in Mississippi, it's been uh, quite scary. Uh, We've been the worst state in the nation at vaccination rates and at COVID rates because of it. And I've really been worried that I still could get the virus given the fact that I'd had the vaccines. Uh, Thankfully, that has not happened. And I also, you know, it's interesting, uh, Mississippi isn't so great about following the rules. And most of the time that works in 
you know, doesn't work in people's advantage. But in this situation, I was able to get a booster shot, which um, I'm thankful for. So hopefully that will keep me healthy because on the horizon, I have a potential very exciting uh, thing happening. Uh, And that is that I hope to be going to France on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday of this coming week to see all of my friends in France and make sure everybody's doing well and make plans for our screening at the DDA Experience on June 5th, 2022. And then Michelle Coupe and I, my co-producer for The Girl Who Wore Freedom, are going to drive to the Netherlands, hopefully getting through. And we're going to go to the market garden commemorations that they have there. I just learned out a couple of days ago that my son, Jonah Taylor, who is in the fifth quartermaster um, unit in uh, Germany, his unit is going to be participating in those market garden ceremonies. So I'm just super hopeful that maybe I'll get to see him while I'm there, just like I was able to see Hunter when his unit participated in the Normandy commemorations. So I'm looking forward to that. And after those commemorations are over, I'm going to be doing pre-production work for the Brave Dutch, I hope, as long as COVID doesn't wreak havoc with that. I'm super thankful to Delta Airlines. They're going to make it possible for me to fly over there and stand by. Virginie Durr, our Normandy contact at Delta, is the one that's facilitating that and helping that uh, come about. So I'm so grateful. Delta has just been an amazing partner for us, super supportive all the way along. People are continuing to write us, email us, text us pictures, tweet to us pictures of them on Delta flights watching The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Uh, I never realized how much exposure that would give us, but it's just been incredible. Uh, The other news I have this week for the film is that we are still in talks with the sub distributor. And so uh, I think a contract is being negotiated. So I'm excited about that, expecting to hear great things uh, shortly. And, you know, other than that, people are uh, writing us that they've watched it on iTunes and they're leaving reviews. And, you know, we're just waiting to see what's next. Every day brings a new surprise. Uh, We're also really focusing on our Brave Dutch pitch. We had to do some more writing this week to um, add in more female stories that we have. So we've got all of that done and hopefully uh, Virgil Films will begin pitching that in the next couple of weeks as well. So I just wanted to review what episode 79, which you're going to hear here, um, At the beginning, I talked about a mistake that I made, and that mistake was in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter. I had mentioned that we were a finalist at the Chagrin Film Festival for two awards, uh, the best film as well as the emerging filmmaker. And the festival had asked us not to say anything about that. Google Alerts alerted them that I had said that in an article, and they I was afraid that I would be kicked out of the film festival or that I wouldn't win my award, but that did not happen. They were super gracious. And, uh, you know, I was very thankful for the grace. Um, now the other thing was back then, again, this was early September. COVID was really wrecking havoc with a lot of the film festivals and most of them were virtual. Boston had decided to have an in-person component as well as chagrin. And, Really, those were amazing experiences. Very different. Chagrin's was a drive-in and Boston was in an actual theater. But I was so thankful for those festivals still um, trying to do the festivals uh, despite COVID. That's happening. We still have two more festivals coming up. The American President's Film Festival, as well as the Tryon International Film Festival. We'll put out more details about those, but they're going to try to power through as well. Uh, I am worried that COVID is going to affect a couple of other things. We have a screening at the Massanutten Military Academy, thanks to Bob and Janie Miller. Uh, that is coming up October you know, 15, 16, and they are uh, an incredible, they were wonderful donors to the Girl Who Wore Freedom. And now they want us to come and show the film to their cadet classes as during their like homecoming weekend. Uh, I'm thrilled about that. I'm really hoping that that can happen. And it was scheduled for 2020 and then had to be rescheduled. So uh, I'm hoping that won't happen again. 
And then we do have this deal that we're putting together with L'Oreal and Fort Bragg and Michelin to show the film during Veterans Day week. And I'm worried that may all not happen either. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. But COVID is still wrecking havoc with our film experiences. So that's kind of a bummer. So anyway, uh, with uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, let me give you an update about Hunter. So in this episode, Hunter had recently come home. He was living at home waiting to hear uh, about his next assignment. Turned out, and many of you have heard this before, but that he was accepted into officer candidate school with the Navy. He did recently complete that uh, in June, and then he went to Pensacola to start flight school. So he is now in Pensacola awaiting for his classes to begin. Hopefully they will begin in October. Uh, I recently saw him. That was a wonderful thing. And he's continued to be a blessing to our project uh, based on, you know, his advice and his help and, we're incredibly grateful for him. So that's your update. It's been a lot of change uh, since this time one year ago. I think we ended up being in 29 to 30 film festivals, winning top awards at 26 of them. Uh, That just is mind blowing to me. And I'm so incredibly grateful for that. Uh, We also um, had a whole bunch of reviews happen since then. And I kept waiting for negative reviews which as of yet, haven't come. So I'm also very thankful for that. Um, So I guess the lesson for this week is uh, when you are in a place where there is a lot of chaos or confusion or unanswered questions, just have peace and, and know that all will become clear. And when you look back in a year, You will be amazed at the progress that you have made, the things that have happened and how far along you got, even if you didn't feel like it at the time. You know, as a mom, I can remember having little kids and thinking I never got anything done. Every day it felt like some sort of circus was happening around me and I just wasn't accomplishing anything. Um, It just felt chaotic and messy and I couldn't really look back and see any progress. One of the sayings I love is that The days are endless, but the years fly by and it seems like, you know, yesterday. And that's true. Uh, When you look back a year later, you will see the progress that was made, even if it didn't feel like the time. So have hope, whatever your current circumstance or situation is today, it will pass and you will be able to look back with some hindsight and understand sort of the chaos and confusion of the time in a whole new light. So with that being said, I'd like to let you listen to episode 79 and enjoy it. I'm so thankful for you to be able to get to know Hunter if you haven't before. He's an incredible human and I'm so thankful that he is my son. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to episode 79 and I hope you enjoy it. Take care. And I'll see you soon. Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey there, Josh. How are you today? I'm great, Christian. How are you? Good. You look very happy today. I am happy today. You normally do, but for some reason, it just stands out more today. I don't know why. And also looking happy is the guy we couldn't do this without, Jason Rugg. Hey, Josh. How you doing? I'm great. How are you, Jason? I'm good. Josh um, and Jason. Jason, I do hope um, you'll feel free to ask more questions this time or jump in. Last time, I don't think you said one word. And I I don't know how we need to change that, but I really I did actually Christian. have a couple questions, but we were running out of time. So I just, yeah. <laughs> uh, we may need to give him the first chance at questions. Maybe. Oh, I'm real bad at first questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a special guest today. And before we get to him, we'd like to get an update on the movie Christian. So it sounds like, Got some interesting updates for us? Yeah, it's been a super interesting week. Um, I'm going to start with the bad news, and then I'm going to go into the good news. 
Um, as you know, this is a first time filmmaker's journey and you know, that involves a lot of times learning from your mistakes. And I made a really big one this week and so I really want to um, encourage anyone out there who uh, is, you know, learning to be a filmmaker when you get to this stage and a film festival tells you to keep something quiet, uh -oh. keep it quiet. <laughs> and I'm going to leave it at that until I'm able to say more. But it has been, it was a very dreadful week. And as far as that goes, and um, it wasn't anything I did intentionally. It's something that I did without thinking. So I got too excited and I said something in a, to someone that I should not have. And that ended up badly for me. So the lesson. Wait, 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 wait yeah. hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, was this on a podcast when you said no, this? No, no. no. Just in person. We're, we're off the hook, Josh. We're good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys are off the hook. Right. No, um, a reporter asked me a question oh. and, you know, I gave an answer and I gave more information than I should have. Now, mm. in due time, I will tell the story in full. But as of right now, uh, I'm just going to say when a film festival tells you not to say anything, you need to definitely not say anything. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I know you can't go into details, but can you say, like, generally speaking, what the consequences were? Like, you're no longer in the film festival or things um, like that? I am still waiting to discover the consequences. Um, I'm oh. still in the film festival, but uh, the consequences have not been revealed to me. I fell on my sword yesterday and hoped by doing that there may be some grace. Uh, and as yet, I heard nothing. So... Look, I hope you use COVID as your excuse because that's, that's the go-to. <laughs> if anything goes wrong, you're like, it's COVID. COVID. Yeah, I know. I'm so tired of that excuse. Um, no, I, unfortunately, I could not. The, the other thing to tell you is the way that this came to light was Google Alerts. So I did learn a lot about Google Alerts this week uh, and how film festivals monitor what you do and what you say. And so uh, that is how... Um, I learned that I had done something wrong. All right. That's the bad news. What's the good news? So the good news is um, we have a really good, good father. I just think God is so gracious and I was so repentant and so, um, you know, I really did take responsibility and I did not at all expect everything to be washed away or, uh, and it may, you know, consequences are consequences, but I just got a huge gift, you know, a few hours after I had fallen on my sword in an email and was just crying and thought, you know, this was the worst day ever. Um, uh, I received some incredible news and it happened sort of in this way. So, did I mention last week that we had gotten into the Boston Film Festival? No. I don't think so. I don't believe so. No. Great. So, well, what happened was after our last recording, I got an email from Film Freeway. And it said, you have been selected for the Boston Film Festival. Now, it, previously to this, I have said, I think the rule seems to be that if I get into a film festival, I get an email beforehand and they tell me I'm in the festival and we begin talking and then eventually they change it on Film Freeway. And I just, that's been the rule with all of them until this one. I didn't get an email, didn't hear anything. And all of a sudden I get an email from Film Freeway that says your judging status has changed. You are an official selection of the Boston Film Festival. Well, my jaw dropped because the Boston Film Festival is a big time A-list film festival. It's been around 36 years. There's a lot of entertainment industry people that live in Boston like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and so many others. And so it's a pretty big star studded event usually in a normal year. And we have been rejected from all of those film festivals. So when it happened, I expected, you know, shortly thereafter to get an email from the film festival, which I did not at all. I wrote them and said, oh, thank you so much. This is incredible news. I can't wait to hear more. And I got no response. Then the next day happened. Nothing. So the day after that, I wrote again and said, 
I meant that this time I started thinking, was this a mistake? Like, was I accidentally, like, did they mean to go not selected and they hit selected? And, and then I wrote him a second letter uh, and still didn't hear anything. So then I was really like, okay, something's wrong. And I had a meeting yesterday with my publicist team. And the publicist team was like, okay, you've gotten some more film festival announcements. Chagrin is coming up. We really need to get a press release out there. Let's go over all your festival acceptances and dates and all of that. And I was like, well, this one's really confusing. And, I, and they were like, that really is weird. That doesn't sound like Boston at all. And we looked at their website and their website had one date and their film festival freeway had another date and an email that they sent me had other information. It was just all over the map. And we tried to email them and the emails bounced back and the phone line was disconnected. And so we were really trying to figure out what to do. Well, my publicist reached out to, while we were in our meeting, PR our contacts in Boston and, and magically came up with the executive director's contact information. And so while we were trying to track her down, I got an email from Robin Dawson of the Boston Film Festival, who is the executive director saying, hi, Christian, this is Robin Dawson. Uh, I would love to talk to you about your wonderful film, The Girl Who Wore Freedom. We are so excited to have you in the festival. Please give me a call at your earliest convenience. And like I froze. I was like, are you kidding me? Like I actually am in. It is not a mistake. I just, I didn't even know what to do. And when I called her, I talked to her for 35 minutes. She was so excited. Um, and she said, it's not just me. I'm leading the charge for sure. But everybody on our team cannot believe what you did as a first time filmmaker with this film. It's so incredibly good. And she said, we want to spotlight you and do whatever we can to help you. Can we have your world premiere? And I was like, I already gave that to Sigrin. Um, so she's like, well, can we have your U S premiere? And I'm like, yes, yes, you can have our U S premiere. Somebody asked me earlier, like, how does that work? You're having a world premiere in Chagrin, but your U S premiere is in Boston. That doesn't seem to make any sense. And I think we talked about this before at some point that the, that the premiere status thing is a legal thing that kind of kicks in and it, it can be fudged in some ways. The irony is the Boston Film Festival is before Chagrin. So it's September 24 through 27. Another reason I was panicking is that's three weeks away. I'm like, we have so much to do. So she just, uh, turns out her father was in World War II and her mother was an Army Cadet Corps nurse. And then so, of course, she, and she's been to Normandy, so she already had a predisposition to love the film, of course. but. At the end, she said, how can we help you? What is your, uh, what's your hope for distribution? And I talked about how I thought our film was a good fit for the History Channel or A&E or, and she said, well, we'll do whatever we can to help you. My twin sister is an executive vice president at NBC Universal. We have contacts at Netflix and, and Amazon and um, we're just, and, you know, we're just gonna see what we can do to help you. So let me get this straight. <laughs> Robin Dawson from Boston said, you're awesome. <laughs> she did. <laughs> mm. She that's, did. That's the coolest did. part of the story right there. I mean, the NBC Universal stuff seems pretty cool too, but uh, that's yeah. the best part right there. <laughs> yeah, it is. I love the way you said that. She did even have a little Boston accent. I love that. So I learned. So wait, did you say, I'm sorry, did you say when the date? You said it was before yeah. Chagrin. September 24th. Okay. September 24th. It is exciting. And what was interesting from her perspective is she's like, you know, I was going to write you yesterday, but like things keep happening. So what I learned was they were going to do a drive-in option and an online screening option. And just yesterday or day before yesterday, the drive-in people called and canceled. So they're like scrambling to find out themselves, you know, before I've kind of complained on here about how it's just such a mess and how, you know, everything seems to be all over the place and it's just so disorganized. And, you know, it really is bad on their end. It really is the, the same stuff that's happening to me as a filmmaker is happening to them as a film festival. Um, and so 
it just gave me some insight when I heard about kind of what they're dealing with to try to put the festival on. It gave me a lot of compassion. Uh, I understood a lot better. I learned also yesterday from Morgan um, Harris, our publicist. He talked to a PR person in Boston to try to understand why when it's streaming, when a festival is going to be basically online, they're going from 100 films down to 14. The reason is the platforms that are hosting these online festivals are charging a penny a minute per film. And because all of these festivals are going online, many of the big sponsors that would be at the festivals, like a Netflix or like whoever, they've all pulled their sponsorships. So the festivals are left with a very tiny budget and high costs, which is why they're cutting down the number of films they carry, which makes a lot of sense. I felt a lot better about that. So, um, so yeah, in talking with her, she said they have one 25-seat theater that they're going to try to have, you know, a screening in. But she said, you know what, we're going to try the Boston Public Library. And they have a 350-seat theater. And I wonder if we can uh, have you screen there. So if that works out, I will probably be heading to Boston you know, in a few weeks in my little brand new Mini Cooper and whoever of my little team is going to go with me. And uh, yeah, so I'm just so incredibly excited about that. I don't even know what to do. Um, so my dad always says, you know, things are never as good as they seem or as bad as they seem. So try to maintain just a steady, steady as she goes um, mindset and that's kind of another lesson that I learned this week. Um, you know, there's good and there's bad, and you just really got to press forward and take one day at a time and not let too much get you down. So that's the update for this week. I also want to let people know, as far as chagrin goes, if you are planning to be a part of our film festival in chagrin, you want to be in the drive-in, those tickets go on sale this Friday. So that is actually today is what, help me out, Jason. So September 4th and the member price, if you buy a member pass, and unfortunately I think it's like $350, you have the ability to reserve a spot at the drive-in screenings before everyone else. So members have a window where they can reserve and there are only 70 spots at the drive-in for our show. So members reserve first, and if there's any spots left over, individual tickets per car will be sold, which are $25 a ticket, $25 a car. So um, you just roll in the dice if you don't, you know, you just got to decide how bad do you want to see our film in person? <laughs> do you want to play the full member price and see, you know, everything for free, or do you want to just wait it out and see if there's a spot? So uh, that's the update for Chagrin. The Lady Filmmakers Festival begins, I think, on September 25th. We'll put more information out about that. But there's going to be a Q&A after our film with Flo Boucherie and her mother, Danny, and different people on our cast. So that's going to be really fun. And that is $10. Um, you can pay $10 and watch the film for that amount and the Q&A. So there you have awesome. it. That's yeah. awesome. What I learned in the week. And right. then we had another one more exciting thing happen. I have hired a new head of business operations. Holy cow. Yeah. I think we talked about this last week. My, my, the first time you said that I, I know who this person is, but when you phrase it like that, I was like, how can you afford all these people? And then I'm like, wait a second. I know how you can afford this person. <laughs> yeah. So we're titling this episode, Hunkering Down at Home with Hunter and the Family Business. And I'd love to introduce to our audience my amazing first child, uh, Hunter Taylor. Woo. Hello, there everyone. <laughs> Josh, you make me sound cheap. <laughs> Uh, you are, you're, you're, you're working for a meal and a place to lay down at night. <laughs> well, I just want to say, Hey, to the audience, thanks for listening. And Christian, Jason, and Josh, thank you very much for having me. 
great but to have th- you. This is how this is how great careers get started, right? You know, they all have interesting stories. You know, it's not just success from day one. So, so you know, it's just part of the journey, right? That's true. So, Hunter, you you uh, are a college grad. You have a degree in business, and you can tell me more specifically about that. Uh, you move back home. You're in between college and new career, and then you found this opportunity to work alongside Christian. So there was a need, you're able to fill it. So we want to talk about that too, but why don't you introduce yourself? Just tell us about your, your background, uh, what you studied in college, your involvement in the military. Uh, start with that. Sure. Um, so let's see, I, uh, I joined the Army in 2012. Uh, I was active duty. I was with the 101st Airborne. Specifically, I was with the first of the 506, which is Red Currahee. Um, I was a combat infantryman. I deployed to Afghanistan in 2013. Um, my unit specifically is an air assault uh, unit. On top of that, we're all, I was in a heavy weapons company. Uh, after serving for four years on active duty, I decided to transition to the National Guard for Colorado so that I could go and pursue my bachelor's degree, uh, which is I decided to go to University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and I was specifically in the lead school of business pursuing a business degree, as you said. Um, the way that leads works is we, we have our major. Um, and so I have a bachelor's of science in business administration. Uh, but then you have areas of focus or areas of emphases. Um, normally people will choose one, maybe two. Um, I ended up doing, uh, information management, which is data analytics. So it's using raw data, cleaning it, transforming it, converting it, and then, uh, extrapolating that information in order to, to create actionable business insights. Uh, I also focused on another area of emphasis, which was strategy and entrepreneurship. And so this kind of goes into the higher levels of leadership for an organization, understanding all of the different functional areas of business, whether it's accounting, finance, marketing, uh, operations, production, et cetera. And then learning how to take all of those those functional areas of business and then make them cross-functional, make them talk to each other, uh, figure out how to make them more efficient. Um, And while I was in school, So I was working in the guard. I also was working at the local hospital and I also started my own business as well. So I do have a bit of experience with that startup entrepreneurship aspect. Um, Finally, on top of all of that through Leeds, uh, Leeds has, you know, one of the greatest uh, corporate ethics and social responsibility departments in America. Um, They're renowned for it. Uh, And so they offer a certificate there. So I was able to obtain a social responsibility and ethics certificate. So this is based off of the concept, I would argue, of um, Milton Friedman's enlightened self-interest. So businesses should not only look out for their bottom line, um, but they should do so in a way that helps others, helps all of the stakeholders who are involved. And the thought process is, if you're providing real value to the stakeholders or to everybody that has an interest in your business decisions, then you will be helping yourself out as well. After I graduated, um, well, so going back before that, about a year before I graduated, I knew that my destiny is supposed to be back in the military. I'm not supposed to be out for long. Uh, And so a year before graduation, I started the process of trying to commission. Specifically, I'd like to go fly, um, whether that's for the Army or the Navy. Uh, I'd be probably just as satisfied with either one. Um, But then due to COVID, that pushed all of our timelines out. Um, and so that, See, that's- There's that COVID excuse again. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Um, so, so COVID pushed back all of the applications, all of the board selection deadlines. Uh, so that kind of leaves me in this, this state of limbo right now. Um, now, I don't know if you know this, but Colorado specifically, the Denver metro area is quite expensive. And if you don't lock in your lease when you need to, it's very difficult to find housing out there because the, the demand for it is just so high. So uh, all of my timelines got pushed back. I hadn't renewed my lease in time. Um, And so what I'm looking forward to next is trying to go and commission. Um, But in the meantime, uh, I came across uh, my mother's project and she had a need uh, that it looked like I would be able to help out with. So here I am. And you're actually in the film and you're part of the reason this film is happening anyway. I mean, you were over in Normandy and your mom came to visit you and that's how she got the idea. Isn't that right? That's correct. I mean, I would say that, that, that I just happened to be there. Uh, God, God chose that to happen that way. But uh, I'd say the reason why 
the film happened is because my mother, when she arrived in Normandy and she looked around and she saw the story unfolding before her eyes that have, has unfolded for, you know, decades at this point, she saw a valuable story there and a story that she wanted to communicate and share with the world. Um, don't, don't be so modest, Hunter. The reason we're all here is because of you. And we all know that. So just want to get that on the table. Well, um, and, and I think that this is a really important part to understand too, is that the, the way that I got sent to Normandy, I actually at first looked at it as a bad thing. Um, I was uh, in, in my battalion, I had won this, the soldier of the year for my battalion. And typically the next step is you go to the next level of competition, which is the brigade level soldier of the year. This year for the brigade competition, they decided to add a new element, which was Army Combatives Tournament. Um, and I do have quite extensive experience in different combative sports, but I didn't technically have the certification that the Army required in order to be eligible to compete. So though I had won the previous level, uh, I was disqualified from going to the higher level due to that technicality. Um, so they wanted to give me a consolation prize is how they put it to me. And so the consolation prize was I was going to go to Normandy to represent the 101st Airborne um, in, in the D-Day ceremonies. So I called my mother on the phone and I said, hey, mom, you're not going to believe this terrible news. Uh, I don't get to go onto the next board. They're sending me to Normandy instead. And my mom on the phone, she says, we're going to Normandy? And I said, no, mom, <laughs> they're sending me to Normandy. And she goes, we're going to Normandy? <laughs> that didn't stop her. <laughs> so, so she had made up in her own mind that she was getting sent to Normandy. Um, so then we, we linked up in Normandy. And my command at the time, the, the, the unit that I was attached to for that event, uh, gave me a lot, of, lot more freedom since my family was there. So we got to do uh, a lot of unique experiences that, that perhaps the rest of the soldiers weren't able to. And during that process, my mother saw an opportunity and a story. And so um, it, it, to me, what it speaks about is that many things which we, and this kind of goes into what we, my mother was saying before I jumped online here, is that it's never as bad or as good as you think. It really depends on how you handle the situation. And so something that I thought was terrible and horrible has, has led to this series of events and all of the work that everybody has put in to, to something that I think is absolutely amazing. So have you ever worked on a film before, Hunter? I have not. Okay. So you are also a first time business filmmaker. Is that fair to say? That is accurate. <laughs> All right. So you get pulled in <clears throat> during the distribution phase. Um, so tell us about that. What's your involvement now, your role in terms of, well, right now we know it's part distribution, but are you doing anything else? So describe what you're doing on the film. Sure. So currently, one of the main reasons that I've been brought in is, as, as Christian said, the, the eagle eye perspective. So kind of looking at all of the current business processes that Normandy Project has going, all of their um, best practices that they're implementing and trying to look at it from a business operation standpoint to see if there's any. How's that looking? How's that, how's that been going? <laughs> well, I, I, will, I will say for most people being first time to this industry and, or, or to this you know, business, uh, I'm actually quite impressed with the, the functional areas currently. I think that everybody's been doing an excellent job. Um, at the same time, I do see areas of opportunity for improvement. Um, I think that there are some best practices we can implement. Um, and so I'll be looking forward to trying to figure out how to implement those changes without shaking the system up too much that it causes difficulties. Well, um, such the diplomat, such the diplomat. Did you hear that answer, Jason? I mean, I, I don't know if I could buy it fully, but well done, Hunter. Well done. <laughs> so, so let me just jump in and say one thing. Um, he is too kind and very, um, you know, diplomatic. But in, in most instances, uh, the places that have been so difficult is that I am not paying people, right? I don't have the money to pay people to do the jobs that they need to do. And A, I'm carrying on a, carrying a lot of jobs that are not my gifting. Storytelling is my gifting. Production, producing something is my gifting. Um, the business of business is not my gifting, you know, putting in place, um, you know, any sort of systems or uh, just the way things happen to keep stuff on track. 
Um, it's just not my gifting. And the people that are on my team, they can only help when they have time. It's on top of their regular lives and businesses because this is not their job. So we, a lot of balls do get dropped and a lot of things are kind of messy and not very streamlined. Uh, but the largest thing is I am so scattered thinking about marketing and distribution and filmmaking and uh, accounting and all this stuff that it leaves me very little time to keep things ordered, organized, and, and moving forward. Not to mention the fact that I've never once, well, I won't say that, the data analytics part for me I valued a little, particularly in social media. I knew that we needed certain metrics to be able to be attractive to distrib distributors, to film festivals. And I also knew that on Vimeo, I was watching who's watching our film, where they are, because we need to be able to tell a distributor, this is our audience and this is how popular our stuff is. So I understood that. But in talking with Hunter in the last little bit, I've realized that data analytics from his point of view could possibly be more helpful than I anticipated. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, Hunter can help us clean up and organize several areas, also my office at some point, but. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that does need improvement, I would say. <laughs> so, no, no, and I appreciate that. Um, absolutely. So data analytics is kind of my bread and butter. Um, I am very much a numbers guy. Um, I've found, I worked on a project once where we were trying to anticipate the, the percentage probability of readmission to a hospital for any given condition. And normally that sounds like it'd be a question that would go to a doctor, right? The same way that data analytics in the film and entertainment industry, it sounds like, you know, the percentage probability of success would go down to a creative. But when you get a full understanding of how the numbers interact with each other and the relationships the variables have, you can start to answer questions that you didn't even know you needed the answers to. So we're going to try to look at the numbers and try to understand how to reach out to different markets, try to find the content that our viewers, our customers find valuable. And at the end of the day, that's what any business does. A business has to seek to provide value and they need to know who they're providing that value to. So if we can try to clarify that even more precisely, I think that we'll be able to really hone in on, on the, the full range of opportunities for this film. Other areas that I'm looking at focusing on would be fundraising. Um, so trying to come up with a cohesive and a coordinated fundraising effort. Uh, we have multiple online projects that I'm looking to try to implement. Um, potentially another podcast is something that we've been discussing. Um, I'm also looking towards celebrity and veteran partnerships. So trying to interact and network through that, that sphere. Um, and we had an exciting success this week you can share. Well, I, I, let's, let's hold off on that until right. it's further along. But if that comes through, that would be very exciting. It's someone that I personally, personally admire. And if we could get- Why don't you not use name, but explain, explain why it's valuable. Certainly. So this individual is a very successful uh, veteran war reporter. So he's been reporting on conflict zones and combat zones across the globe for decades now at this point. He's also a very, very accomplished and talented director and writer, producer. He's also an, the author of one of my favorite books. Um, it's a blend between um, the, the realities of warfare on the ground as, as well as the psychological implications and ramifications that come from war. Um, this, this individual is, is absolutely brilliant. I think that he has a true insight into the heart of a warrior um, and I think that he does a brilliant job of of explaining that to everyone. And if we can get this person to view our film, and if a, a lot of the themes in the film actually very much translate to his book. So, um, you know, it'd be very and, interesting. Uh, wh what did you say the title of the book was? I didn't say that. <laughs> but good catch. Go <laughs> well, but the, the exciting thing was, that, you know, where I've been hammering to try to find people like that to endorse our film or to partner with me in any way, and I've gotten no responses other than Joe Montaigne. That was exciting. Um, Hunter got a letter back right away. So Hunter wrote one letter and wanted to open a discussion, and we sent it to a, you know, publicist person, 
but the uh, the guy wrote him back directly from his personal email and said, what do you want to talk about? So which, that's which honestly just goes to speak to this guy's character. I mean, he's, if, if we can open a dialogue with him, I think it'd be beneficial, not just for our audiences who I think would love his content, but also I think that we would be able to reach out into his market. So I want to say a couple of things here uh, for our first time filmmaker listeners. You know, I said earlier at some point that I realized in the beginning of this journey, I needed to hire an archivist producer very early on and not at the end like we're doing now. I'm learning from Hunter, it is incredibly important to start with a business operations guy in the very beginning as well. Um, just because I think that if we had been able to work with him earlier, um, some of our journey may have been different and a lot more productive. We've sort of been stumbling around in the dark, and now I feel like Hunter can bring some light to that. The other thing is, by bringing Hunter in, we've opened up new avenues of communication. So, for example, uh, one of the tools that Hunter uh, really needs is a data analytics tool that costs like $5,000 a year. But because he was in business school and he knows someone there who interacts with the software that he need needs, he can reach out to them and say, hey, can we partner with you? Or the, And the same thing, he knows several different people in a different field and industry than I have access to, and he's bringing those contacts and those relationships to our project, which I think could you know, be very helpful down the line. And, you know, and that's what I think the beauty about networking across different industries is, is because in order to develop any business, you have to have a wide, wide range of networks and contacts. Um, and not everybody can specialize in everything. And so, you know, my, my goal here is that hopefully I can, you know, focus in on my area of expertise and I can bring what I can to the table. And hopefully as far as distribution goes, which is one of our, it's arguably the biggest uh, uh, hog on the table right now is we need to figure out how to come up with a distribution deal uh, with a strategic partnership that benefits both organizations and we can figure out how to negotiate uh, who bears liability at what rate and who bears you know risk and and who also you know how the 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 outcome of that distribution looks um, for both organizations so that's one of the things that we've been looking at in our current negotiations and hopefully we'll have good news soon when will we have news? Because we've been talking about this distribution deal for a while now. And quite frankly, I don't know how the listeners feel, but I am tired of talking about it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. You may have to deal with us a lot more, a lot longer simply because um, it is a slow process and everybody needs to be very careful because there's a lot of money and rights involved. Now, this week, we also received the contract back from our lawyer, who revised some things that we are now going over and making sure it's an agreement that we can live with. And then we're going to, as soon as we're ready to say that, we're going to pass that on uh, to this potential distributor. So, you know, it's still going to take some more time. I recommend, you know, I mean, I expect them fully to come back to us and say, nah, you can't have all of this, but, you know, here's what we will give you kind of thing. So it's, it's just going to take time. We're not rushing anything. We don't need to. Um, so, and I think another important concept out there for any other potential, you know, creatives or filmmakers or producers would be, um, it's not just how you run the race. It's also exactly how you finish too. You have to finish strong. And so, um, in order to get over this finish line, we want to make sure that we do it right. Uh, we do it justice to all of the veterans, um, who've contributed all of the French citizens who've been a huge part of this project and also to our viewership. You know, we want to make sure that, that we cross the finish line, uh, in a way that is satisfactory to everybody. And on top of all that exciting, great stuff, something that's even more incredible about being home, in my opinion, is that Hunter is now able to go with me to Ohio. He's now able to go with me to Boston. So it's this short window in time. And again, I've been thanking God for the pandemic unlike any other time since it began. I'm genuinely thankful that because of it, it's brought Hunter here. And now 
we can experience these things together, but also our audiences get to meet him. You know, we talk about him so much in the movie and it's, I sort of feel like it's, you know, one of the stars showing up at the screening. So that's really a special thing for me. I didn't anticipate uh, that happening, but I'm really glad Hunter can be there for our world premiere and our USA premiere. And one of the things that I've learned personally through this pandemic and through the, the unnatural times we live in is, you know, I've heard rumblings throughout, you know, the society that people are upset having to spend so much time with their family or having to spend so much time in close, you know, proximity to other people. But take it from somebody who hasn't really seen my family much over the last decade. This, this is a huge important time in my life to me where I get to reconnect with my family in a very different way than I was growing up. And honestly, this, this could be one of the best things that came out of this pandemic is being able to reconnect with my family and spend that time when it doesn't look like in the foreseeable future, I'll get time like this again. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Jason, do you have any questions for Hunter, the business manager? Yeah, I do actually. Um, so you're, you're talking about all this data and how you're going to be analyzing it and everything like that. What I'm curious about is how are you getting the data? Are, are you sending out surveys? Are you just looking at raw analytics? Like what, what, uh, what exactly are you doing to retrieve this data? So I think the answer to that would be yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, there's there's many different sources of data. So, um, the easiest one most people would be able to be familiar with would be um, social media that provides a lot of uh, easily organized, easily retrieved data, um, primarily because a lot of those platforms are engineered to, to take down that data for their own business processes, but it's also useful to, to people who are using the platforms. Um, another, there, there's also a difference between primary data and secondary data. So primary data would be data that uh, we go out and collect ourselves. So that could be um, market research. I mean, the, the best example that I have would be if you're trying to open up a coffee shop in your you know small town, you go outside Starbucks in town with a clipboard and you in a clicker and you keep track of how many people per hour walk into there. And so that gives you very, um, specific local area knowledge. So you know kind of about what the demand is there, especially for brand name, you can really take down that data personally. And so that's primary data, you're getting that. Um, secondary data, I would source through other areas. So I would look at IBIS World um, or uh, you know, a lot of times Harvard Business Review or something like that, where I can look at historical data that may not necessarily directly translate to our, our concept, but we, we are able to extract business insights from it. Um, the other thing too is that, you know, I'm, I'm tossing around the idea of um, trying to post surveys or, or conduct um, questionnaires at the end of the video or put them up on, you know, social media and have people try to click and engage on it. So there's, there's other ways that we can do it other than just using the built-in platforms that social media has. There's primary data. There's a bunch of different things we can do. Well, and also don't forget, not only do we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, but we also have YouTube. And then our film is hosted on Vimeo. So we have Vimeo, um, which gives us a lot of, you know, insight into data, you know, location and time and how long people watch. And we can track that it came through Film Freeway or it came through a private link that we sent. But I haven't been able to understand a lot of that data or figure out what the implications of that would be. So that's where Hunter is useful. I've been curious about it and I've wanted to know, for example, I wanted to know if we didn't get into a festival, can I look back and see if they actually watched our film? Well, the answer is, yeah, we can probably do that, but we need somebody like Hunter to show us and, you know, sort the data. And then we also have website information, lots of website information. We put out a blog, we put out a podcast, we have a lot of stuff there that we can track that tells us who's listening, what they're interested in, and uh, what they're reading. And that helps us, um, you know, figure out what our audience is and what it isn't and who we might want to reach out to that we haven't. So to give a specific example, um, going off of what she just said, one of the things that I'm really interested in, and this just personally, is 
we have a bunch of different blog articles that are on the website and some of them are more popular than others. Now, each of the different blog articles has different content in it. Sure, they're all blog format. Sure, they're all, you know, written by, you know, volunteers, but what they talk about contextually is different. And so my question would be, I want to see the relationship between the content that is popular compared with the reader, the demographics of the reader. Who is drawn to that content? Who is looking for this? And if we want to keep focusing in on that target market, if we want to focus in on that readership, then we can produce more of that content. If we're trying to branch out and try to capture a different audience, perhaps we go and look at the other content that's popular, but it's not our top read. And so I can look at the relationship between multiple variables and try to figure out a path forward. Good question. I'm very, yeah, I'm excited to start having more updates in the business world, you know, cause it's like, I feel like this train is like beginning, the wheels are starting to move and it's leaving the station and like, like there's a direction, right? There's a purpose. And so very excited about that. Yeah. I really feel like um, it's interesting. I've been catching myself saying, I thought the hard work was behind me. And I thought <laughs> that was the mountain that I was going to climb. Right. And now I'm learning that that was the easy part. And now there's so much more ahead that I didn't really understand. And like Nicole said last week, when I get distribution, I could decide to back out and just let other people handle it. But I'm an entrepreneur at heart. And not only that, I feel like this project is far greater than just licensing it to someone. I would like to use it for educational purposes, for healing purposes with wounded veterans, um, you know, going through PTSD and stuff like that. And, and like I said before, I, this is going to be a property I'm going to pass down to my children. It will be here and around longer than I will. And I do need to prepare someone to take that over. And what better person than my son who started it all to begin with? Right. But I would like to be clear. I'm not the creative. So glad that part's for the most part behind us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I speak for a listening audience when I say, you know, we're excited to see Christian and her next of kin at the drive-in in Chagrin for the win coming up very soon. Nice one. I love the way you wrap that up. Bring it all around, Josh. <laughs> all right. Well, Christian, anything else we need to say before we say goodbye? Nope. I just want to thank you listeners so much for continuing to listen and follow us. I do hope that it has been helpful for you. Please leave us a comment on iTunes or Stitcher or YouTube or our website uh, and just let us know what you want more of, what you'd like us to talk about or what you are enjoying. Um, definitely think about stopping by our store to purchase some of our merch. That'll help us a little bit. And uh, spread the word, share, every, you know, things on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And, you know, that is a great way to help us. If you can afford to make a donation, that's on our website. And we would be incredibly grateful. We are still uh, experiencing major shortfalls in that area. And we have lots to do. So thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to Documentary First where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. You sure can. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>